Blessed Pentecost, the Global Harvest family, and all those watching. This is our first Pentecost Sunday during a, such a time and season as we're living in, during a lockdown, movement control order during this pandemic. It's something uh, very different, unexpected, but God is doing something, and, uh, and we need to be aware of what He's doing and the reason, the purpose, He has permitted what He has allowed. And um, unlike or very similar to Passover, we are in our homes. Um, we have another couple of weeks before we are allowed to meet in small groups. But God is speaking to us, even as the church globally is gathered by their families. Every church is family-sized. And, uh, and it's not a coincidence that, like the Passover, Pentecost was also happened in a dwelling place, a home, where the disciples lived and, and stayed together. And uh, so we're going to look at the purpose of Pentecost, the power of Pentecost, and how we need to have our, our own Pentecost every day. In the Pentecost speaks of 50, 50 days since Jesus ascended. And it's very symbolic because Jubilee is a powerful theme in the Scriptures. You know, the, the Jubilee blessing speaks of uh, restoration of relationships, of what was lost and stolen, restoration of properties, cancellation of debt. And, um, and I believe that the church, we are entering into a jubilee season, even this year, 2020, the year of, of vision fulfilled, the year of prophetic revelation. So let's, let's pray as we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, even as the church globally remembers the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we may f be filled with power, to fulfill the Great Commission. Father, we just thank you for each one here this morning. We pray, Lord, that you'd anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear your voice, even as I speak, that your word would pull on every stronghold, vain imagination, and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of you, and bring every thought of ours captive to the obedience of Christ. May our minds be renewed, our hearts transformed, and may we never be the same, Lord. And fill us with your Holy Spirit. Even as we hear your word, let faith increase. Even as we hear your voice, Lord, we thank you for the spirit of faith. We thank you for your pouring out your spirit upon us. Yes, let, the, let your prophecy through Joel be fulfilled again and again, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh, upon each one of us as sons and daughters, and upon our sons and daughters, Lord, upon families, Lord. All those that are hearing this word this morning, we thank you, we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we all are familiar, most of us are familiar with the Great Commission in Matthew 28. But you know, the commission in itself does not equip us or empower us to, to fulfill it. And so Jesus made it very clear. After giving, he, he said to his disciples, Do not leave the city, do not leave Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high to be witnesses. So let's just read what he said in Luke 24, the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verse 46. He says to the disciples, It is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and the repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So the message to be preached is repentance and remission of sins. Verse 48, and you are witnesses of these things. Verse 49, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued or clothed with power from on high. And Luke again mentions this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we're going to look at this word witness. What does it mean to be a witness? Why we need the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness? Why the commissioning is not, a, not sufficient by itself to be a witness? Why being saved and born again is not enough to be an effective witness? To be a witness effectively as the Lord Jesus wants us to be requires more than just being born again. It requires us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which can happen at the same time as our salvation, but oftentimes happens later on, almost immediately after or, or whenever, whenever, but it's not the same thing. Being filled with the Spirit is not the same thing because we know that in John chapter 20 or 22, Jesus breathed to disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they had already received the Holy Spirit. And yet he tells them to 
not leave Jerusalem until they're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So receiving and being filled are two different things. And we see later on in Acts, besides Acts chapter 2, the disciples were filled again. So there is one baptism for many infillings and refillings. It's a daily continuous process. Ephesians 5 says, Be ye continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. But we're going to focus on the word witness. Okay, it says here in Acts 1, but you shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. It doesn't say, and you shall witness, but you shall be a witness. And this speaks of each one of us as messengers. We are also the message. The messenger is the message. And a messenger who's not a message by his lifestyle, the word of God calls us living epistles, read by all. And if our lives, our daily lifestyle is not a witness, the words we speak and the works we do are powerless. You know, the foundation of witnessing through signs and wonders and miracles and, and sharing the good news, the foundation is living a life that bears witness of the resurrected Christ. Jesus is alive. So I want to focus this morning why the power of the Holy Spirit is twofold. It's not just to enable us to, to do powerful things that are impossible with man and only possible with God, but why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to be clothed with power from on high so that we can be a powerful witness in our relationships, in our day-to-day -day life. So that when we speak, as, as is often quoted, Share the gospel, and when and where necessary, use words, right? So many times, you know, we can focus, and we've seen this where many have focused on, on giving the gospel, sharing the good news of the gospel, and, and doing wonderful works, and even healing the sick, and, and doing amazing things. But yet, when many new believers tap into the church, for lack of a lifestyle or witness of Christ's character, many do not last. Many get offended, many walk out the back door, and so we need to restore the foundation of becoming, being a witness, which speaks of personal transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot change without the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not just mind over matter. It is not just positive thinking, a positive confession. It's a thinking and confession that is based on God's Word that doesn't just inform us, but changes the way we think so that our minds are renewed. And the word transformed in Romans 12 too, which says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, is the same Greek word for metamorphosis where a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, where it dies to itself in the cocoon and a new creature comes out, a new creation, a butterfly. No resemblance except perhaps the body between the wings. But we are called to be new creations in Christ. So what does this word witness mean? Why do we need the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit, to be witnesses, to be changed, to be transformed, to be the message before we bring the message? before we do good works. And in fact, it's not just before, but at the same time. right? We're all a work in progress until we meet Christ face to face. We never arrive. As my late dad used to say, we're all, we all students at the school of the Holy Spirit in which nobody graduates until we see Jesus. Amen. We're always in a constant state of growth, becoming more and more Christ-like. And, and as we obey, we become. And as we become, we obey. It's a, it's a cycle of doing and becoming. You know, we are called human beings, not human doings. And so the foundation of all our works and our doing is becoming. And religion is doing without becoming. And this is why Jesus was very angry with the religious leaders who were so focused on the outward appearance of righteousness, but they had not never changed in the inside, on their hearts, in their character. They knew the Old Testament, they knew the law, the Torah. They were sticklers for the letter of the law, but their hearts were unchanged. They had no foundation for the doing. And so this is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit to become as a foundation for what we do, of giving witness to the resurrected Christ, of giving witness that Jesus is alive, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the word witness, very interestingly, comes from the Greek word martyrs, which speaks of being a martyr. Now obviously, you know, the disciples, and, and, and uh, tradition tells us that except for John the Beloved, all the other disciples were martyred. They gave their lives for their faith, 
And that is like the ultimate witness a person can, can have to sacrifice his life for the gospel, for Christ, as a testimony of what Jesus did. But the witness thing that we are asked to be, to be by the Father of the Holy Spirit is to die to the flesh, to die to that that, that hinders us from being the, the effective witness that we are meant to be, that God has called us to be. And we know that before Pentecost, all the disciples except John ran from Jesus. They were so afraid for their lives. They are full of fear. They had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus, I mean, even Peter, who so boldly and confidently declared to Jesus that he would never leave the Lord, denied Christ three times. But you see the difference when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So being filled with the Holy Spirit really deals with the spirit of fear. Fear is not just a feeling or emotion, it's a spirit. And Timothy says, God has not given you and me a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And when the day of Pentecost had come, and from that point onward, the disciples were filled, they stayed full of the Holy Spirit, that they were not afraid to give their lives to the gospel. They were no longer afraid to risk their lives to the gospel, and except for John, all died as martyrs. So, what does it mean to be a witness? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. Martyr. We have, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to be crucified with, to live a crucified life with Christ. I mean, that's what happened when we got saved, when we got born again. But many of us don't, you know, it's one thing to, to know our position in Christ, but it's another thing to walk it out. We, we can only walk out who we are. We don't, we don't practice to become, we practice because we already are. So because we are in Christ Jesus, we have been crucified with Him, we can walk in the resurrected life. And so Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I look at what Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what does this word witness mean? One who has crucified the flesh. Because it is the flesh that keeps us from being the witness we are called to be. It is the flesh that keeps us from displaying the power of God. Not just the power of signs, wonders and miracles, but the power of a transformed life. The power of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The power of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. It is the flesh that hinders the fullness of Christ from being manifest. And so we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be clothed with power to crucify the flesh, to walk out who we are in Christ. Romans 8, verse 13 and 14 says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now what is it talking about? Dying if you live by the flesh and living if you live by the Spirit. It's talking about the presence, the manifest presence of the Lord. Okay, because this, as we know, death is separation. Physical death is where our physical bodies are separate from our spirit and soul. But spiritual death is where our, our spirit man is separated from the Spirit of God. And when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they didn't, they didn't drop dead that day or that second, but they were separate from the presence of God. They hid behind the trees. They hid from the presence of God. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit to crucify the flesh. Amen. And the good news is this. It's not that we don't have to struggle and strive in our own human effort. But the Word of God is so powerful and it says, look, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, He gives us the desires of His heart. He puts His desires for us in us so that they'll become one, so that we will want what He wants for us. When the, the desires of the Lord is in us, Philippians 2 goes on to say, it is He who works in us both to will and to do according to to his good pleasure. So even the motivation to obey comes from him. So this is the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us his desires to work in us and to will so that we will desire and want to do what he wants us to do. And how do we do this? We need to put on the Lord Jesus so that we can abide in him. You know, many of the promises in the word come to those who speak about if anyone be in Christ, if any man be in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? When we are born again, the Spirit of Christ comes in us by the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. But that's our position in Christ. But the power of, of our position is when we are in Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. But when we are in Christ, it's the glory 
that manifest of our hope. If any man be in Christ. And so we're going to look at this morning how we can be that, that empowered witness by the Holy Spirit by abiding in Christ as we put it on. How do you abide in Christ? How do you remain in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? Not just Christ in us. You know, the children of Israel came out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. And that's the challenge, isn't it? When we're born again, we come out of darkness into the light. But many times, there's still some darkness in us. And this is where the work of, of, of sanctification comes in, where it's the work of discipleship, where as we mature and grow, any part of the world that is in us gradually decreases, and we're crucified to the attraction of the things of the world. And Romans 13 verse 14 says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. So we want to walk as effective witnesses. We want to display and represent Christ the Son by the power of the Spirit. We need to put Him on. Ephesians 4 verse 23 and 24 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So this is how we crucify the flesh. We crucify the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit, by putting on Christ, so that we can abide in Him. And one of the ways we can abide in Christ is by putting on the garments that He has given us. You know, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And the Lord is called the Lord our righteousness. He is our peace, Jehovah Shalom. He is our joy. In His presence there is fullness of joy. So when, how do we put on Christ? We put on the garment of salvation, the Lord our righteousness. We are in Him. We are in Him. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly... Rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As the bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as the bride adorns herself with her jewels, the Lord has clothed us with the garments of salvation and covered us with the robe of righteousness. Some of you may remember the story of, of um, Isaac's sons. Esau and Jacob. What did Jacob do? How did he get the blessing of Esau? He put on the robe, the fur coat. And what felt like the other son, what smelled like the other son, was just the covering. And in the covering, he took on the identity of his brother. And so when we put on the Lord Jesus, when we put on the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness, we are abiding in Him. We are abiding in Christ. See, the Lord is our praise and our salvation. So we need to put on the garments of praise. When you put on the garments of praise, you step into His presence. Psalm 100 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. So when we choose to praise, especially when it's hard on the flesh, when it's difficult, right? It's easy to praise when everything's going well. It's, e it's easier to praise before this pandemic happened, a lot easier than it is now. But when it's hard on the flesh, that's when praise becomes a sacrifice. Because sacrifice is always uncomfortable to the flesh. It cuts the flesh. When an animal is sacrificed, it is killed. It dies itself. So when we choose to praise, when there's nothing circumstantially, or when, when, when things are hard and difficult, and we choose to praise, we offer a sacrifice. We're crucifying the flesh that wants to yield to its feelings. But yet a sacrifice to praise is when we begin to focus not on the wind and the waves and the storm, but we begin to put our focus on the Word, and remember who the Lord is, what He has promised us, what He has done for us, and what He is doing. And as we put our focus on that, we put on the garment of praise, and we are putting on the Lord Jesus, and we begin to abide in Him. And now the, the, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit will empower us to crucify the flesh so that we can be effective witnesses. Amen. You need to put on the robe of righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Put on our shoes of peace. He is our peace. And in His presence, where is His presence? The Lord inhabits the praises of His people. And as you begin to praise and thank Him, there will be joy in His presence, a supernatural joy that will energize you and strengthen you. And that is how we abide in Christ. If any man be in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It does not say, if Christ is in anyone, but if anyone is in Christ. And this is the biggest reason why there are so many 
born-again believers who are living defeated lives because Christ is in them, but they are not in Christ. They're trying, to, they're trying to live a victorious life on their position, but not on their walk. Positionally, Christ is in us, the Holy Spirit in us. But the blessing and the victory and being overcome is when we are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Because when you are in Christ, you have the mind of Christ. You have the renewed mind of Christ. And that is how we get transformed. We are transformed by the renewing, renewed mind of Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this newness is when we learn how to abide in Christ by putting Him on, putting a, a robe of righteousness, a garments of praise, abiding in His presence. And that is how we seek first the kingdom, how we stay filled. And here's the key, here's the power of all this, of being effective witnesses. John 15, verse 9 says, you know, read just this four verses, verse 9 to 12. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Jesus says, abide in my love. When you're in Christ and you abide in Him, you abide in His love. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. And what's his commandment? Verse 10 says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Verse 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So let's read this again. As, my, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you love one another as I have loved you, you will abide in my love. So how do we abide in, in Christ? By loving one another. And how do we love one another? as He has loved us. Remember, in, in, the, in the Old Covenant, the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But here in the New Covenant of grace and truth, Jesus says, look, I give you a new commandment. A new, what's the new commandment? The new commandment really empowers us to fulfill the great commandment. The new commandment is, love one another as I have loved you. And when you begin to know how much you are loved by the Father, when you're rooted and grounded in the Father's love, that love displaces the spirit of fear. That love empowers you by the power of the Holy Spirit to freely love, to freely give out what you've received. And when you know how much is, you are loved by the Lord, by the, our Heavenly Father, you can love Him. You can love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you know how freely He has first loved you. Amen. We have first been loved by Him. And when we freely know how much we have been loved by Him, we can love one another. So as the Father loved me, Jesus said, I have loved you. Remain in my love. Don't step out of His love when you're offended. Don't step out of His love when you're provoked. Abide in His love. It's easy to, 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 to be loving when you're loved. Right? The world can do that. The test of supernatural love of your relationship with the Lord is, is when you're provoked, when you're offended, when the flesh is offended. That's the opportunity to demonstrate the difference the power of the Holy Spirit makes upon us. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments by loving one another as I loved you, you will abide in my love. And these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Love and joy go together. You can't separate, separate both of them. There is joy when we walk in love. A supernatural joy that passes all understanding. And the last part of this message, so to summarize, what does it mean to be a witness? Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power to be. In other words, to become as we witness. So to become a witness as we witness of the resurrected Christ through his power. To heal the sick, raise the dead, cast the devils, signs and wonders. The Lord has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His name is the same, Jehovah Rapha, Healer. His name, his name did not change at the end of the New Testament. Any dispensation does not change the name of the Lord. It does not change what the kingdom is. Not only is his name Jehovah Rapha, Healer, his name is Jehovah Shalom, our peace. In that Shalom, there is wholeness and completeness and health of being one. His kingdom is righteousness, peace. Righteousness, shalom, and joy. 
And so this is the power of the Holy Spirit, that when, when we are clothed with power from on high, and the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we're going to go into this, what actually happened. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, He comes upon us not just to do things, not just to preach, but to demonstrate, to be the message that we are called to be. So that when we speak the message, we as messengers will give credibility and authenticity to the message that we speak. So that because when we are known by those around us who do not know Him, when our lives are a testimony, they will hear the good news that we bring. And so if we want to be witnesses, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to receive His desires in us as we delight ourselves in Him, so that He will work in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. And as His desires are in, in us, we will choose to praise Him, to put Him on the garments of praise, the garments of salvation, so that we can abide in Him. Because as we abide in Him, that's where the power of the Holy Spirit is released. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And as we abide in Him, we abide in His presence, we abide in His peace, we abide in His joy, we abide in His power. And this is how we grow as effective witnesses, to become, to be the witness, to be the message before we bring the message. To be the message, to be the living epistle. Amen. Now let's look at the day of Pentecost. It's amazing. You know, this Pentecost, as I, as I shared at the beginning, we're all in our homes, in small, in, in our family groups. And, and the upper room was the place where they stayed together. As I shared last Sunday, they dwelt there. It's interesting that it wasn't ground level. It was above the upper room, first floor, if you like. Ground floor and first floor, one floor up, above ground level, in heavenly places, looking down, above the circumstances, not under the circumstances. And who was present? Remember, remember this, Jesus spoke to 500. And the Great Commission, it was one commission to, uh, to diverse cultures. He said, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus was speaking to all Jews who spoke Hebrew. And yet he was saying, look, do not limit my commission to just your people who speak your language. But it's got, got to go beyond those who are just like you, who look like you, who sound like you, to those who don't look like you, who don't speak like you, who don't speak a language, who have a different culture. And the commission is really to the nations of the earth who are not like us, who are different, a diversity. And so Pentecost really is, reminds us of the power of unity in diversity. That's what unity is. The difference between unity and uniformity is in, there is no diversity in uniformity. Uniformity is like a uniform, exactly the same. Same cut, same design, same color, everything's the same. But unity speaks of a harmony of diversity, difference in the right place, in the right order, like the colors of a rainbow. Different color, each, each color in the right place. The unity is like the flavors of a delicious meal, different ingredients, different spices if you like, the right quantity to produce it. Wonderful taste. A diverse, the unity of an orchestra, of a band. Different sounding instruments playing together as one. And that is what the body of Christ is called to be. We've been given, given different gifts, different callings. And the sad thing is without the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not complete one another, but compete with one another. And so we need to abide in His love so that we are secure in our uniqueness, in our difference. If we are not secure in our uniqueness, we will become threatened by somebody else's gift. Your tribe will want to have what somebody else has. We'll try to be like somebody else. Yes, we need to represent Christ and be Christ-like like others as role models. Like Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But we're not trying to, we are about becoming, having good examples and role models is not to deny who you are, your uniqueness. And so in the Great Commission, Jesus was telling the disciples, oh, do not keep this message to yourself. And so you need power to bring this commission to those who are very unlike you. And that is why you need the Holy Spirit. So the commission gives us the authority to go, but the power of the Spirit gives us the power. And the word power in X18 comes from the Greek word dynamis, where we get the word dynamite. You know, when Jesus said, I give all authority has been given to me, the word there is exousia, it's the power of authority. 
But the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the dynamics, the dynamite to do the works of God, to become, to change, to be transformed, and to do what Jesus did. How? Firstly, remember this, the commission is like one commission, diverse nation, diverse cultures. And in the upper room, you know, Jesus didn't just tell Peter, Peter, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, you don't go. It wasn't a, it wasn't a personal command. It wasn't just to Peter, James, and John, asking the three of them to wait to be filled with the Spirit. It wasn't just to the 12 disciples. He, Jesus gave this commission and the, and the need to wait to approximately 500. He didn't keep it to just his leadership. As many who were willing to wait would be filled. And unfortunately, only 120 waited in the upper room. And in the upper room, you see three distinct groups of people. You see the leadership of the New Testament church, the senior leadership, Peter, James, and John called the three the pillars of the New Testament church. You see the rest of the disciples. And then you see the relational leadership of Jesus, his, his mother, Mary, and the brothers of Jesus. And I remember this on the cross, Jesus connected Mary and John. He said to Mary, this is your son, John, this is your mother. So John was one of the senior apostles and disciples, and his Christian mother is there, Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. So you have the leadership of the New Testament church, you have the family of Christ, and then you have the rest, the, the congregation, if you like. And so you see the three groups of people. They were, they were all united among themselves. The disciples were one. The family of Jesus were one. And the rest were one by faith. They believed what Jesus said and they came. Okay, now this is important because Jesus expected them to wait together. He didn't say, right, you all go to your own houses and, and wait for the power, wait to be filled with the Spirit by yourselves in your closet. No, it was a corporate infilling. They had to wait together. Why? Because of the power of unity. You see, to be an effective witness, we've got to be one. And this was the last prayer of Jesus. By this, the world will know we are His disciples when we are one, by our unity. Our unity gives testimony of the Father sending the Son. And so to receive the Holy Spirit, to be a witness, of what witness are we if we are divided? Right? Or what witness is all the power in the world to heal the sick, to raise the dead, if there's this unity? And the problem of this, and this is why we have seen, we have all the problems we have in the body of Christ, because in, in terms of works, we are successful, but in terms of relational health, we are not very healthy. Because we are focused so much on getting power to do without having the power to become, to crucify the flesh. And so the Holy Spirit wants to come upon us so that we can not only be one in our own, as a family, like the family of Jesus, Mary and her children and her sons and daughters, not only can we be one in our, in our leadership roles, in our ministry roles, like the 12 disciples with Matthias who replaced Judas, but we can be one in faith like the rest of the 120. And so when each group is one, together, X two one says they were in one accord. The twelve disciples were in one accord among themselves. The family of Jesus, his mother and brothers, were in one accord among themselves. The remainder of the one hundred twenty were one accord in faith, and the three together, the threefold cord was power, was dynamite. And as they waited for ten days in the place where they dwelt together, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, came upon them suddenly. And this speaks of what happened even in the Passover, which we celebrated in uh, April, Good Friday as we call it. Where did the power of the Spirit come? Christ is our Passover, the blood on the doorpost of the house where the families, where the, the Israelites, God's people, the sons, the children of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, had to meet together by their family. It was, it was many upper rooms with the blood of the Lamb sprinkled on the door of the rooms of families. And so we see here, in the Passover, it was the 12 tribes gathered by their family. and the day of Pentecost, it was the leadership, the family of Jesus, the remainder of the 120, together, one in their own unit, and one together, relationally. They were one in faith, they were one in spirit, and the Holy Spirit came. And so this is a message for us. We cannot separate the power of the Holy Spirit from our relational walk. We cannot focus on, on trying to 
witness with our message and our preaching and our teaching and our miracles and our good works, we are not being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit to crucify the flesh, to abide in Christ, to put Him on, so that we will be living epistles as the salt and the light. And the, the witness of lightness in its difference from darkness. The influence of salt is in its difference from what it is bringing salt to. So we cannot win the world by being like the world. We cannot diminish what we say and what we do by not being a witness ourselves. The message is the messenger. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, He gives us the power to crucify the flesh so that we can put on the Lord, abide in Him, put on the robe of righteousness, the garment of praise, the shoes of peace. We can begin to live in response to who He is and what He's doing and His promises and not be distracted by darkness so that when we get tested, when our love is tested through offense, we are hidden in Christ. We have His mind. We respond in the opposite spirit. Love is patient. Love is kind. We don't react, but we respond by the Spirit. There's no greater witness. You know, it is the foundation of who we are becoming that strengthens what is achieved by what we do. So that when the world comes to the kingdom, comes to the Lord, through our message, through our good works, through signs and wonders, and they come into relationship to the body of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit that keeps us one will help transform, bring transformation. So this is the Pentecost message. As you hear this in your home, remember this. God has allowed us to be family-sized for almost three months now. Right? We've been called to social distance from those outside the house so that we can draw closer with those inside the house. Now remember this. The disciples could have been offended with each other, mad with themselves. How could they have forsaken Jesus at his greatest time of need? They had to forgive themselves. The others had to forgive them for being poor examples. You know, can you imagine? Not only does Peter deny Christ three times, he cuts off the ear of a high priest. And they had lots of reasons to be offended, to be sad. That the one they've been following for three years now had been taken from them. They've gone back. They're at a loss. What did, what did they do? And yet, they were one. They were one. And another coincidence that the suddenly of X2 came simply after it says they were in one place, in one accord. And this is the challenge. You know, for almost three months, we have been in our own home. But the day will come when we have the freedom to come together. And what the Spirit wants to do when we come together, He will not do when we're by ourselves. Jesus didn't say, right, disciples, you meet in the synagogue, or you all meet in someone's home. Mary and, and, your, and my brothers and sisters, you meet in your own house. The rest of you, you meet, you stay in your own house. He didn't divide them by their, by their groupings. It was as they came corporately together, the Spirit came out. The Spirit fell upon them. And so remember, Ephesians 4 talks about the life that is supplied through every joint connected, how the church grows, or what every joint supplies one another. Psalm 133. The blessing of life is commanded when brethren dwell together in unity. All right, so this is the message of Pentecost. It's the message of the life that is attracted to unity so that we can demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit, not just by what we say, or what we do, but by who we are becoming. That we can walk in the life of Christ as the salt, as the light of the earth, bringing light to darkness, not being offended with the darkness, bringing flavor as salt adds flavor, preserves, makes the loss thirst. Right? What does salt do? It makes us thirst for the living water. So may you be the light in the darkness, May you make the lost thirst for the living water in you as you, are, as you walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit this Pentecost Sunday. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you pour out your Spirit upon each one this morning as they hear your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light, as you are in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Fellowship, communion, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So Lord, I thank you, Father, for doing a work of, of healing and unity in the families here, Lord, that you are preparing us for the day that we will come together as they did on the day of Pentecost. And we thank you, Lord, that even as, as we come together as families, as leaders of your church, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your oil, your balm of Gilead, the life will flow down our heads, Lord, as it did upon the head of Aaron in Psalm 133, as it did upon Peter and the disciples and the family of G your family, Lord, in the upper room, as it did upon your families during the Passover. Pour out your Spirit, Lord. Command your blessing of life to every home here, Lord. 
that the presence and power of your life will be a testimony, a witness of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit. Father, may you bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May you lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. And may you release healing right now to all those who need healing. Release their shalom. Thank you, Lord, for the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ, dwells in us and quickens our bodies, Lord. Same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in each one of us. We release your resurrection life, Jesus. Let your life flow. Let your river flow. Let everything live where the river flows. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.